digital transformation has been a force that's been driving change in global supply chains on profound levels for a long time at an ever-increasing rate, as obviously, as we all know. And to lead the discussion on our next panel, which is a virtually limitless application of technology in global supply chains, I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Christina G Dean, founder and CEO of Redress. And I'd also like to invite back to the stage Reza. Uh, for the other panelists, could you please provide a, a brief introduction to yourself and the company? Christina's uh, expertise spans fashionable, uh, sustainable fashion, journalism, and NGO management. She founded Redress in 2007 and over the past 10 years has successfully grown the organization to its current position as a globally recognized leader in its field. And if there's anything else you'd like to add, please do so. So I woke up this morning with a croaky voice. And I thought, oh my goodness, can I get through this? So I do apologize for this husky version of myself. <laughs> Brief intros, for, except for yourself, because you've been on stage already. Start with you, 30 seconds. <laughs> hey, uh, hi everybody. I'm uh, Mathieu Labas. I'm the chief marketing officer at Kema, uh, uh, in charge of marketing, obviously, and also in charge of technology partnerships that we have. Uh, I'm based in Paris, France, traveling to Hong Kong uh, regularly, so it looks like the uh, protests are following me, actually. Um, are you in <laughs> London much with Extinction Rebellion? I I'll go there next week. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer. So I'm from a Hong Kong heritage brand that has been around for 66 years. It's called Chicks Lifestyle. Um, I'm the fourth generation for this brand, and I'm trying to reshape our brand to make it more sustainable, transparent, and also really to promote buy less um, and really buy better. So this is my mission for this generation. Hi, I'm Angie Lau from Clover Group International. They beat us by three years. We're three years younger. Oh. <laughs> I'm the second generation. Um, I'm also chairman of the Hong Kong Intimates Association. I also work with the government on the fashion summit. I'm on the steering committee and also on sustainable fashion um, business consortium. Uh, Reza, we've met you already. So, um, my first question, obviously our title of this panel is Traceability to Sustainability, and we've picked up on this in the, in the previous sessions. How are brands tapping into the power of digital innovation um, to make their supply chains more sustainable? And I'll start with you, please, Jennifer. Yeah, um, to be honest, it's actually half a year ago that I got in touch with blockchain. I never thought blockchain can be supply, um, applied in fashion industry. So I've been working with WWF and a platform called Textile Genesis, as well as Lensing. So within three months, we actually applied this technology without traveling. It's through um, uh, conferences, uh, WeChat, and just three months. And then we managed to apply the whole uh, technology from raw material to spinning to our manufacturer and then to our brand and to the consumer as well. We did not launch the app because it's a proof of concept, but it just shows that technology, if you want to do it, you just start and try and then it just happens really fast. So it doesn't sound that scary. It, it's not, it's not at all. Okay. So the training for each party, it was just basically an hour and a half. It's more of the buying in of the supplier. And so it's really amazing nowadays that you don't have to travel, but all our suppliers are from different regions in China, and then it actually happened within three months. Um, Angie, representing both Clover and also through the Hong Kong Intimates, you obviously have a great insight into what brands, not just your own business, but other brands around the world in the intimate sector, how they are adopting the sort of in technical a digital innovation on the supply chain? Speaking for Clover, majority of my customers are from the US. Um, playing devil's advocate, uh, we have been tasked to do all the traceability on zero um, tolerance and everything. Um, unfortunately, it's not an ongoing exercise uh, because brands are more aware still at this stage how the FOB price affects them. and. Uh, but however, on our side, we are continuously pursuing this route to making sure that all our products are traceable. 
If I recall your intros correctly, you're three years different age group in terms of the age of your businesses. You're second generation and you're third generation. And you're obviously bringing traceability and sustainability in the business. You obviously think it's important. Otherwise, I think we wouldn't all be here if we didn't yeah. believe it to be important. Um, I don't know if you've read the Fashion Transparency Index, which was released by Fashion Revolution. If you haven't, I strongly suggest that you do. The executive summary usually says it all. Um, and it's really looking at the brands that are increasing their... Um, their transparency. 2019, 2018, 2017, I suggest you look at it because you'll see a trend and the trend is not going away. So I'd like to ask you that same question, like obviously not from a brand's perspective and, and for yourself, Reza, the same question. What do you see with um, the business and brands around traceability and sustainability? I'll start with, we shared a lot of numbers, but I'll start with two numbers. Um, one is that when we ran a survey a couple of months ago uh, to, to buyers, or clients essentially, we found out that only 10% of them uh, thought they knew really 100% of their supply chain, of their suppliers. So most of the brands know their tier one suppliers, but as soon as you go to tier two, tier three, and what about the meals, and what about the accessories, then it becomes a bit of a, uh, it becomes a, a bit darker. So that's one thing, 10% only uh, know, know, know fully their supply chain. The other stat I can share is uh, so when we are tasked with an inspection, with an audit, our clients, the brands, give us the, 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 their supplier details. And in more than 30% of the cases, actually where we need to go is, is different. It's not that original address that was, pro that was provided. So it just tells you that there's a long way to go to, have, uh, to really achieve a full visibility and transparency into the, into the supply chain, basically. So what is, how do we get there then? What are we gonna do? I mean, where does technology play a role? Not just looking at blockchain itself. How does technology help us to drive this transparency? So I'm just gonna, take a step back and uh, I remember a year ago uh, I went to a sourcing event and uh, there was uh, Christophe Roussel who might be there by the way who's uh, uh, the SVP of GAP and he said the holy grail finally is still to have uh, a demand driven supply chains. I've hearing that for the last 15 years to be honest. Uh, to get there how can we do that? It's all about data obviously. Uh, we talk about uh, blockchain, IoT. Uh, in the end is how do we capture data? How do we make it more predictive, et cetera, et cetera. And that has implication in terms of recycling, uh, limiting our waste, et cetera. Uh, another stat, and I will answer your question with that stat, is uh, if you look at uh, numbers, 90% of the whole data in the world has been created over the last five years. Th that's tremendous. So how do we make things happen? I mean, going back to, to your question. I think in the end, it's not technology. If you really ask me, uh, and there are many surveys we show that it's the talent. Because all, all the organizations are aware that they need to make things happen. If from a bold perspective you arrive and you say, I want to have things change in the next uh, five years, you need to have the right people. The right mindset, but the right people. So it's about skills. If you have the data now, what you do with it, how you make things happen, is more important than the technology itself. Okay, can I, yeah. Uh, well, what would be a good conference without a Steve Jobs quote? Uh, to, to build on that, uh, he said, Steve Jobs, something along the lines of, uh, technology is nothing, actually. What really matters is uh, having faith in the people and giving them the right tools. And this is really what it's about. Yeah. When you think about supply chains, and, and improving transparency, you need the right tools and you need to onboard people, you need to onboard suppliers. Concretely, you need to, to, to be there and help the, the worker uh, uh, get into a new tool, help, help the factory managers uh, input data in a new platform. And yeah, I fully agree with that. It's really about the people. I would like to add to that because um, how I talked my um, supplier into it is actually because before we start with our supplier, we choose anything. We will tell them our philosophy. So we will say it's the best for the family. So our customer is your family. Everyone is the family. How do you treat your own family? So it's about the good. 
And then when I talk to them, they say, okay, we start with the, it's a why, what, how. So we say, oh, why do you want to do this? It's actually for the better good for the society, the community, for the future. And then from that, they will say, oh, it's not just uh, about cost. It's not just for profits. It's really for the higher purpose. Then they bought into the whole concept. Um, so this is not just the technology. It's the soft side is very important. Yeah, I think soft side is good, but I feel like we just don't have time for softness. I want, yeah, I mean, I agree with you wholeheartedly, but and I agree that you know, people talent, the the culture of our times is radically important. But we also we're here to talk about also technology and the digital side of it. So, I was about to say something, yeah, yeah. if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah. Um, as an example, we've been I've been struggling to get the brands on board. All right. Um, as a manufacturer, we look into digitization. 3D visualization is very popular in the apparel world nowadays, but not in the intimate world because it involves 3D. All right. So we have been able to master through that, and we've been showing all our customers this is what you can do, and you can save your whole trail of sample making um, throughout the, you know, going into the future. But after showing everything, they still need their samples. They still need it in every single color. So I, I'm talking about a struggle that is all about mindset as well. Mm -hmm. But in that sort of um, 3D sampling, that obviously helps with sustainability from fewer sampling and wastage, etc. Yeah, but that's what? A lot. That's a lot of wasted time, yes. money, effort. You're talking cetera. about each customer may want 3,000 samples a season, yeah. and yeah. you're talking about. 30,000 samples um, uh, you know, yeah. over three months. Yeah, but we've spoken about this before, Angie. And, and, and yeah. Last time we spoke about this, sorry, we, this is like an old conversation, <laughs> an old argument coming up on stage now. We right. said, that, you know, it's also the supplier's responsibility to push harder to these brands because the designers can't visualize without touching and feeling. Exactly. I mean, it's a you play a role, right? Yes, yes we're, pushing. we're and, pushing. But are they taking it? Not yet. So, not. so why not? It's the mindset. They still want their, you know, they would say the, the CEO wants to see this or the merchandiser needs to feel it. They still need it. Okay. Right. Well, we won't argue about that one no, anymore because that's a design problem. We need to go back to the design schools. Yeah. But I'm actually really wanting to push down on traceability at the moment. Uh, again, going back to, you know, the, the survey research that you introduced. Um, and we've spoken about blockchain and I, I really don't understand traceability in relation to technology, but I want to explore that and I want to ask you, you know, are there startup businesses or new tech that's lurking around coming in, into the sector that, you know, people in the audience should keep an eye out for? Are there any new solutions coming out there that are, you know, on the cusp? Um, previously, I've read about our provenance uh, no, or the, uh, for the blockchain, but it's more on not on the apparel industry. And then previously, I think a few months back, uh, LVMH started their blockchain um, uh, technology called Aura. So it's starting, but I think it's still quite new to the apparel industry. Um, it's very, I think, it, in the pharmaceutical and the, the food industry is quite... Uh, uh, successful, but apparel is still a miss because uh, there is two. It's just very complicated in there. So, but I think LVMH is quite a new one in the market right now. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, to to build on that, uh, we we see that happening obviously for a, a price point in terms of items which are quite premium and high. So where basically it makes sense to introduce that type of traceability for fake reasons mainly in the industry. Uh, that started with Asia, obviously, with China, uh, but now we, sh we see the shift, uh, obviously, uh, going to Europe for very different reasons. Uh, this is more to give a peace of mind in terms of traceability to the customer, not really for fake, but origin, etc. Uh, but in the end, it's the same. It's really to link one physical object to one piece of data in a reliable way. You call it blockchain or anything else, yeah, that okay. doesn't matter. Uh, blockchain in the end what matters is really the database or the mindset behind which is to ensure in a transparent way that you can capture a data which is reliable mm -hmm. that's the only purpose of a blockchain mm -hmm. I would say uh, to uh, just comment on your point which is uh, how to make it happen uh, I thought that stat was also interesting I, I mean I'm an engineer so I like to mm -hmm. quote a few stats time to time 
Uh, when we look at uh, sustainability PNLs, and there are a couple of companies which are doing that, Nestle, uh, uh, Caring, etc. Uh, Caring quoted a number. I uh, don't know how it's calculated exactly, but let, let's, for the argument's sake, so they said 93 percent of their PNL, uh, the footprint was, was outside basically their uh, their own, uh, I would say, direct impact. So how do they make things change? And that's the interesting question. So for example, you take a bag, and they were quoting that example, uh, which is to say that it's made of leather, but to get to the sustainability, traceability, etc., they also have to work with the food industry, because leather is a byproduct of the food industry. So it just gives a food for thought that uh, in the end, of course you need to have trust. Trust is in the data, but it's also in the partners you bring around the table to bring an alliance or whatever we call it. That leads me really to a question which is, I'm going to read it out, get it spot on here. When driving technological innovation throughout the supply chain, what are the best practices for getting supplier buy-in? Leading straight from what you were saying. So I would say that, uh, again, building on transparency, it's the exchange of information. Minimizing waste, collections, I mean, fashion is obviously about trends, etc. Uh, I think what is important is to see how data is changing this demand-driven, uh, I would say, chain. And this, we observe it. We can really see it happening now with clients who ask us to help them on projects uh, to really make sure to set standards, for example, in exchanging data. How does it happen on an automatic way to really build it back mm -hmm. in the supply chain? But more on a practical level. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, if I can uh, add something. Uh, I believe something that really helps if you want to onboard supplier on any technology project, mm. uh, not just blockchain, but is to have uh, 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 boots on the ground, basically. Uh, if, if you're planning a large-scale technology project, you can't just plan it, launch it from an office in New York, you know. You need to have people on the ground who can go there, who can run a workshop, who can who can explain basically what, what, what it's about. This is exactly what you said, you know, what, what's in it for them as well. It's very important. Yeah, explain the, to them what, what's in it for them. Do both of you on the sort of supply side want to talk about a best case example, like of how either a brand has helped to adopt with yourself or how you've pushed your suppliers? So real sort of a practical takeaway. I think really it's our philosophy. And also, you will have to, pay, like for us, we will talk to the supplier and say it's a long-term investment as well. Because for technology, it's, sometimes it's like a big cost in front. But at the same time, you look at the long-term, it's actually, it's better, it's more time efficient, it's cost effective. And then it's it's back to the philosophy and whether we think the same or not. I think that's, it's important for us. Yeah. Did you want to add anything? Um, what challenges actually could arise through the sort of technical innovation on digitization in terms of sort of labor on the, on the supply chain? Like, do any suppliers feel threatened by the, you know, integration of digitization in terms of labor force? I believe um, in the intimate world, that's um, what I know, um, are very proactive. Um, majority of our 130 members in the associations are very forward thinking. If you look at the way they implement all the sustainability programs that's been bestowed on them by the brands and the in their own initiatives. For example, Crystal Group is doing a great job in, in leading the world in this part. So I believe it's all about the mindset of the owner and you know, of the supply chain. I think the oh, it's quite interesting because like from previous panel, a lot of people ask, oh, how come your company wants to invest in these or try out these kind of technological things? I was like, it's actually, it comes up from the top. It's us, the brand drivers. It's, it's not, it's really a brand, whoever owns that, if they believe in it, we drive it. This, I think this is very important. Yeah. yeah the, I think it's Lean who shared earlier that... Uh, uh, in, in, in our consumer product supply chain industry, majority of uh, the, the, the buyers are more in, the, in this like late majority stage and not really early adopters. It, it's not often, I think, that you would find brands, buyers that are ready to be early adopters mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of any technology uh, for that matter. 
For example, my sister and I are strong advocates, so we um, tread very closely with Hong Kong Rita, the Research Institute of Textile and Apparel, and we've joined hands with Edwin Key, the CEO, to go to United Nations and start an initiative on waste management and chemical management. And also, um, we also joined the United Nations COP um, Charter 24. So these are the things that has to be done proactively. So we're talking about early adopters. I like the way um, that, you, that you said that. So looking at emerging sourcing regions, what do you think they can learn from? If we could call, can we, is it fair to say China's and Hong Kong has been an early adopter in, time, in terms of the digital? For, um, for our, my experience, because uh, most of our manufacturers are still in China. Yeah. We tried to source it out of China, but in the end we found out that the technology that they are using and then also their, their quality is really good. Um, so in the end, and also also the uh, minimum order as well, the more practical. So we, after all these vetting and then all these exploration, in the end, I think China is still quite the forefront in the manufacturing. And what do you think emerging sourcing regions could learn then from the China lessons? Um, going back to technology from a practical perspective, I think the, the access and the cost basically to those technologies is so low that uh, I think it's now uh, becoming compelling as a case for countries like Vietnam and so on to have, uh, I would say, 4.0 or whatever we call it, factories. Now, it's still early stage because I believe that, uh, again, it depends on what you're making in those factories, but we see it happening. Having sensors, having uh, people who really use data coming out of, uh, I would say, on a daily basis, this is something our clients use. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and for sure it will come to those uh, new emerging countries, but uh, we also need to realize that China has such, uh, uh, is, is so, so, so much advanced uh, when you think just internet speed, like this is a basic indicator, like China average internet speed is like three times higher than yeah. that of India, for example. Yes. And so it's years before we'll see Vietnam, Myanmar, India catch up. And there's one thing a little bit particular with China that maybe cannot really be replicated is that it's such a big market with such an advanced infrastructure that they build their kind of own world technology ecosystem, you know. Uh, you have WeChat in China. Can you have the equivalent of WeChat in any of these emerging countries? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, to, to add on that, we, we all hear a lot about GBA these days, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time around it, but you talk about infrastructure. Obviously, Internet is part of it, but you have all the remaining infrastructure with the uh, different uh, cities which are now becoming very important. Uh, we play an important role in the Dongguang pro province. Uh, so this is the reality uh, we see with the clients shifting routes, making sure that, uh, for example, they leverage competencies from these different cities, and obviously with the backbone, which is uh, with Internet, Shenzhen, and all these uh, uh, important cities. Just like uh, no conference is complete without Steve Jobs' quote, uh, no uh, panel of mine is ever complete without a forward-thinking quick snapshot. I'm going to give you a crystal ball. I haven't warned them about this one. I'm giving you, uh, we're, we're meeting in five years. No, let's say three years. Crystal ball. What's going to be the biggest uh, revolution, new stuff going on within traceability and sustainability? Mathieu. How much time do I have? Uh, you've got about 25 seconds. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, no I, it's not really new, but uh, to me, I believe what, what really, it has started already, but what really will be the game changer is, is data, is big data, and the use of, of data for predictive analytics, uh, for risk mapping, uh, and this is, this is how sustainability will, will improve, and, and but with the use of more more data, more accurate data, more understandable data. This, this, is, this is what's going to happen in the next years for sure. Um, what I'm hoping to happen is not only the front of the supply chain, but the back. Like After you bought the clothing, what will happen next? I think in the next three years, more customers will be um, looking into what's next for the second-hand market, the recycle part. Um, I'm hoping that the customer would drive us so that we can make really a sustain, uh, uh, go towards a sustainable brand. 
So I think it's a consumer's mindset change as well. I'm hoping that the brands will also help to invest in the sustainable process uh, in the supply chain because it costs a lot of money to invest on blockchain technology and uh, you know all these important data collected. I agree with you. Thank you. <laughs> but, but, but do you it's a concerted it's effort. A yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, but do you really think the brands will do that? No. no. <laughs> I don't think hoping, so. Hoping. I'm hoping. Okay. Good. Three years. Yeah, we're very hopeful. I still dream, you know. So. Okay. Um, I would add an optimistic note, which is trust. Uh, I think, uh, to me, that's really where people are realizing really the importance that, uh, of trust. It can take a lifetime to build, and we all see with brands, they can lose it overnight. And to me, this is a trend that's going to be uh, stronger and stronger. So in five years' time, that would definitely be uh, what I would say. That's wonderful. I'm going to add a green finance, by the way, because I don't think the brands will pay for it. So I'm, all, I'm gunning for the banks. Yes, talk to um, HSBC. Yeah, HSBC. Anyone else out there? Um, I, I apologize for my voice. Thank you all of you for so, being so wonderfully um, generous with your knowledge. Uh, I think it's time for a break. Um, I think Courtney will... We're going to have a, a quick 20-minute... Yes, thank you to our panelists. Sorry, that was... <laughs>